Today I'd like to talk about aizome. Aizome is indigo in Japanese and aizome has so many fantastic features. For example, we dyed this in a indigo workshop and it's supposed to be able to repel insects. It's supposed to have antibacterial properties. It's completely natural. The way it's grown is usually grown without pesticides. So when you're using it as well, you can feel confident doing a workshop or for the people making the products that the indigo, if it's a natural indigo, is not going to be damaging to the person who's manufacturing or the tourist who's trying the workshop. And then after the process, when it's put back into the water system, it doesn't cause any damage. Some people use gloves when they do the workshop, but it's not necessary. So it's very non-toxic, it's very natural from the time it's grown until the time it goes back into the environment. So it's a very circular economy type of product. It's fantastic and I'm a big fan. You can see Aizome products all over Japan. It's often called Japan Blue or Japan Indigo or Japan Aizome. So you can see it in jeans. Made in Japan jeans are popular all over the world. You can see it in lots of different products from scarves to bags to maikake to some of the products I introduced at the Akaito coffee shop that they're making from the denim with the aizome dye. So you see it all over in Japan. It's such a popular product. And it's made in Japan, it's grown in Japan, it doesn't cause any damage to the environment, it provides a way to perpetuate traditional Japanese culture. There's so many wonderful things about it. So I'd like to introduce a little bit from the workshop that we did doing indigo dye, both the fermented dye and the fresh dye. So it was the first time for me to try a workshop and I realized how long of a process and how tedious it is to make the fermented dye. The fermented dye however is stronger. It's the one that can really dye a dark blue on aprons for the food chocolate company for example or the dark blue colored indigo for the norin that you see hanging in shop windows or inside people's houses in between the rooms. Um, the fresh indigo dye, on the other hand, with the fresh leaves, that was the first time I've seen that process. So you take the fresh leaves, you put it in a blender with some salted water and you blend it up. And then if you have really light material, like a light silk, then it can have a really light blue color. So it was really interesting for me to see both of the processes and to learn more about Japanese aizome. I hope you enjoy seeing more pictures and videos from the workshop and I will definitely be introducing more places and more factories and more manufacturers which are using aizome in Japan. We had a chance to talk to Mai Gaki-san, who's a teacher of the Aizome dyeing process. She has a workshop in a sake brewery in Saijo in Higashi Hiroshima or East Hiroshima area. And she first explained about the fermented type of indigo and how you need to ferment it over time at the right temperature, very similar to the sake process. And she said, you can see how energetic the dye is by the look of the bubbles. Here, Maigaki-san is explaining how all the leaves are collected in the next room. And then they start the process of making the fermented indigo dye based on the poster and the steps in the poster. And it takes about three months of fermentation using ash in the water to make the water a uh, perfect alkaline and making it into a dry powder as you see here. 
Here, Maigaki-san is explaining all the different ingredients that are necessary to make a nice, natural, fermented dye vat that you can use over a few months. It takes about three months to make the indigo powder from the leaves, as explained before. And in the water, to make an alkaline, they use hardwood ash and other ingredients, and it has to be the perfect temperature. Here, Maigaki-san is explaining when you know it's time to harvest the leaves at the best time is before the seeds and the flowers start to form. So if the seeds are already there, like she's explaining here, the leaves would have less power. But if you can take the leaves before the seeds develop, then the leaf will have a stronger dye effect. Here, Maigaki-san is explaining how the leaves are sent from the farms in these reusable straw bags. That's another sustainable feature. And she says about one-fourth of these bags of leaves becomes one vat. Here, Maigaki-san is showing us some dark indigo color that a friend of hers has asked her to dye again because they want the deepest, darkest blue, which takes multiple times dyeing and drying. And then she's showing the different colors. So some is a lighter blue, some is a darker blue. So if you want that deep, dark blue, you have to use the fermented dye many times to create that deep, dark color. Here she's insisting that if you want the dark blue deep color, you have to do the dye technique in the fermented dye over and over and over again to get that effect. Here Maigaki-san is checking the things that we brought, which we were hoping to be able to dye with the indigo um, fermented dye today. She's making sure that it's light enough cotton that it will really be able to pick up the color effectively. Maigaki-san was very careful to clean the material very well before using it in the fermented dye. This is both to make sure the color is picked up in the most effective way, as well as to protect the vat of indigo dye from contamination. She has to use the same vat of indigo dye many times over the next few months. So both making it an effective process to pick up on the material as well as protecting the vat of dye are both considerations for what is put in to dye in the process. Here you can see um, dyeing the scarf that we brought. We put it in the fermented dye many times and then wring out the excess and then open it up to add air to the effect of the dye. This is an important part of the process. Many times dipping it, uh, getting out the excess, and then opening it up to the air and then putting it back in. So it was a very long process. We had to do this and repeat many times. One of the things she was looking for each time it was put into the vat of dye was to rub the material in there and make sure the dye was hitting all parts of the fabric to make it most effective in covering the material completely. <laughs> so, <laughs> like raising kids? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's important.
part of it in the beginning. Yeah, you got to do it right the first time. Yeah. Mm. It's hard to fix later, right? Mm. Yes. Right. Yeah, you know that. Right, yeah. Yes. All mothers know the same that. Way, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Raising kids and dying in indigo. <laughs> same same strategy. <laughs> After repeating the dye process in the fermented vat of dye many times, and pulling it out and checking that it's dark enough, and then you take it over to fresh water and rinse it out. And you can see the color changing under the water and it becomes a dark blue. After the fermented dye, we had a chance to try fresh indigo dye using fresh indigo leaves. First, she took the leaves off of the stems and she showed us how if the stems still have their roots, you can put it back in soil or you can put it back in water and the leaves will regenerate over and over again. For the fresh dye technique, we also tried to make some designs by using simple clips around the silk material and then dipping it and then after the dyeing process to take the clips off to see a unique and original design. This is a very simple way to create designs. The instructor also showed us books and other materials around the studio which had more complex designs if you become an expert. Here she's showing the color that you can get using the fresh indigo leaf dye technique. And if it's a light silk material, it seems to catch this fresh dye technique the best. Here she's holding up another dyeing technique with design that you can do with the fermented dye to get the darker blue color. Here she's showing us a technique using a chopstick and scrunching the material and then tying a rubber band or some kind of tie around it and dyeing it that way and then taking it off after it's washed. Using the fresh leaves to make an indigo dye was very quick. There was no long waiting process and you could dye something almost immediately. There was a lovely fragrance of like fresh mowed grass or a shot of wheatgrass if you're into your health foods. And it was a very enjoyable process. You don't need to wear gloves. There was a very light uh, dyeing effect on your hands if you didn't use gloves. You can see the fabric starting to pick up the color more and more. At first it was a light green color and then became a darker green color the more it was put into the dye. And then again, like the fermented dye, raised out and given air and put back in and it picks up the dye in a stronger way. Making the fresh indigo mixture with cold water and fresh leaves. Blend it up and soak for about 10 minutes and then uh, aerate it, right? Put it in air for a little bit and then washed in fresh water. And you can see it's become this beautiful light blue color. And apparently this color is really strong and lasts for a long time. You don't need to dye it again, it doesn't fade. It's all natural. And you can put it right into the river. It's all natural, it's all good. A very echo process, a very echo product. You can only do the fresh dyeing with what kind of material? Is it silk? Silk. And then the fermented dye 
can be used on cotton. What do you think of the process? It's a pretty cool process. You just get the leaves, blend it up with some water, and put some Ooh. clips on the silk so it makes like white patterns mm -hmm. and that's what like dyeing it is actually about is making white patterns that aren't penetrated by the um dye it's really so, pretty yeah, it's yeah. cool and that's just folded material clipped yep. before you soak it right Overall, both the fermented dye process and the fresh dye process was such a wonderful experience and such a great chance to learn more about this aspect of Japanese culture and heritage, which is good for the people, good for culture, and good for the environment. I look forward to introducing another business or product which is using Japanese Aizome indigo dye in future.